The Internet is the defining technology of our time, an historic revolution in communications for the human race that is changing the world. Well, the Internet is the next big thing. It is on a par with the wheel and fire and language and the printing press. The Internet enables millions of people with personal computers to communicate and connect. It's email. You've got mail. It's news groups and chat rooms. It's also the world's largest marketplace and shopping mall. And it's a link to websites the world over with information for every aspect of life and even the life after. This is, in fact, the telecommunications infrastructure for the 21st century. But where did the Internet come from? How did it get started? And who built this essential tool and playful toy to millions? And where is it going? This is the age of the Internet, a global network of computer-based communication. At the turn of the 21st century, millions of people around the world are now online every day to exchange messages, conduct business, meet people, and find information. Free from the limits of time, distance, and even tyranny. Computer communication can also be a tool of war to manage materiel and manpower, as the UN coalition did in the war against Saddam Hussein. If you knew where things were, and you knew what was available better than your opponent did, then you could organize uh, your offensive. And I think we learned that lesson pretty clearly in the 1992 Gulf War, where we clearly knew where things were better than our opponents did. But the Internet is also a vital information link. During the Kosovo crisis, it carried uncensored news past state-owned newspapers, television, and radio with the real story of the Balkan tragedy. Be it peace or war, the worldwide use of the Internet is practically indispensable. Yet its origins date back only to the 1950s. No invention in history has grown so fast to touch so many lives. It's something that we didn't see with the telephone, with the automobile, or with the printing press. This is an absolutely incredible communications tool, and it gives us instant access to things happening everywhere. In scope, more email is exchanged on the Internet today than first-class letters delivered by the U.S. Post Office. In financial importance, the Internet generated $301 billion in business and was responsible for one-third of the total U.S. economic growth in 1998. It is a key component of our culture and civilization. And yet, no one really controls it. Things that, that matter the most usually don't have anybody in charge. The seminal idea behind the Internet was envisioned by a psychologist named J.C.R. Licklider, a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the 1950s. Licklider's vision was that computers would allow you to communicate better and that would allow you to connect all the computers together so that they might be more useful in the sharing of information among people. Computer communication was a flight of imagination far beyond anything at the movies. Computers were portrayed as sci-fi props like electronic brains alongside robots, ray guns, and flying saucers. In fact, the idea of a worldwide communications network of computers was far more imaginative than anything Hollywood came up with. After all, the first computers were monstrously large and expensive devices that were never intended to communicate. All the computers were as big as a room. You were lucky to have one in a city, or maybe one on a campus, or if you were lucky, one in a room. They could have remained standalone computing machines for a long time. But a frightening display of Soviet scientific superiority during the Cold War spurred them into teamwork. In 
In October 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik. To catch up and hopefully surpass the Soviets in space technology, President Eisenhower created the bureau at the Defense Department called ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. It was in charge of the space program, which then included computer science. But when the space program got its own agency, NASA, computer research fell into relative obscurity. America turned its attention to conquering the stars and beating the Russians in space. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. While America gave birth to a space program that grew from a crawl to a run by presidential edict, computer communication was in the embryonic stage, but it was making progress. At MIT, a graduate student named Leonard Kleinrock began applying queuing theory to data transmission. Queuing theory is a fantastic tool for evaluating computer and communication systems. You know, a queue is a very simple structure. It's simply a system to which you arrive, hang around a while, and leave. Like letters going through post offices, Kleinrock showed how packages of data would queue or line up at the nodes of a communications network as they transited through. This way, he could determine the overall speed of the network. He then showed how to speed up the network by implementing two techniques, demand access and distributed control. So the point of demand access, you don't get it till you need it, is the key idea for effective resource sharing with data networks. Now the second principle that I uncovered was the idea that to use distributed control in a network, no one switch, device, authority should control the entire network. Rather, every switch should share in that control. It should decide the routing procedure, it should decide how much traffic is allowed in, where it's going, when to do reassembly, when to do all of the functions in a distributed fashion. Kleinrock's work was a dawning light on Licklider's vision. It was the aha that computer communication could one day be a reality. It also marked a revolutionary departure from the telephone system's use of a technology called circuit switching. When you make a telephone call, you pick up the phone and you dial a number. number and the switching system that connects you with the other telephone actually creates a circuit between the two machines, between the two telephones. And that connection is dedicated to the conversation. Even if you're not saying anything, the communications path is in place and it's kept there until one or the other of you hangs up. The telephone system had an Achilles heel and still does. If the connection path between telephones is broken, the call is lost. That weakness became a matter of national security to the military in the early 60s, when they feared a Soviet nuclear attack. Besides leveling American cities, the telephone system would be so damaged that the military would be unable to launch a counterattack. To assure retaliation, America needed an indestructible communications network. Paul Baran was hired to see if one could be built. We started off by uh, playing with uh, fishnet type networks so that if you chop it up, there's still a path through the network. Now the problem was we didn't know how to do that. So came up uh, with the notion of uh, what we call the hot potato rooting, sort of a demonstration that it's doable so the traffic could find its way through the network. But to do that, you had to chop the data up in little pieces. Hot potato routing meant a message transiting a network got to where it was going, even if part of the network was destroyed. But how? Baran was inspired by a previous study of mice in a maze. Claude Shannon, in 1952, built a machine that modeled a mouse finding its way through a maze. And said, well, if a, we can model a mouse going through a maze, then we should be able to do the same with information. So the information flows along in each of the packets that's necessary to find its way through the network. That's the key. Next, 
Borrowing an idea from the telegraph, Baran decided to chop up each message into small, equal-sized pieces, called packets. Each packet was like a postcard, with a to and a from address. Each packet gets a header put on it, which says where that packet wants to go, and you launch that packet into the network, and it goes hop, hop, hop through the network, followed on the heels by the other packets, and they may take different paths. But no dedicated path is constantly available for them. They'll find their way along paths that are available. Then, Baran allowed each node to decide where to send each packet as it traversed the network. A node was like a post office that knows where next to send a postcard as it continues its way from sender to recipient. But unlike a post office, a node would keep copies of the packets and keep sending them out until they arrive successfully at the next node. This design for a network, a packet switching network, gets its messages through better than telephones as long as some part of the network functions. The telephone system, which relies on dedicated circuits, fails when circuits are broken. By 1962, there was enough research and theory to show that a viable computer network could be built. But implementing one had to wait seven years, until 1969, coincidentally the same year man first walked on the moon. While this space triumph grew out of a national fear of Soviet domination, the first computer network stemmed from the frustrations of a single ARPA scientist, Bob Taylor. In the early 1960s, surfing was the search for the perfect wave. Mail was only delivered by the post office. Online meant waiting behind someone at the movie theater. And the server was a waitress at your favorite drive-in. Hello, can I take your order? Make mine a ham sandwich and coffee. But as the decade wore on, new ideas were reshaping America. For some, civil rights was the cause, or stopping the Vietnam War. For others, it was landing on the moon. But in the world of computers, the new big idea was something called time sharing. The old computers had been big machines that you punched cards and you submitted the cards in decks and the next day you got the answers. But in 69, time sharing was happening where you would actually sit at a terminal and you would type in your questions and your programs and the answer would come back two seconds later. If you were very avant-garde, you had a terminal in your house and you were logging into a computer across town. In 1966, Bob Taylor of ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, needed a separate terminal to log into each of several time-shared computers at research centers across the country. No two computers could talk to each other. So Taylor had to move from terminal to terminal to work on a different computer. He knew a single terminal could suffice if all the computers were in a common network. Taylor wanted to build a network because he thought it was crazy that he had to have three different terminals to talk to three different machines instead of one terminal that could talk to all three. So his notion was to pursue the creation of a network which would link heterogeneous computers to each other uh, through this network. Taylor asked his boss for money to build a computer network, arguing that it could save ARPA time, money, and resources. It was a very straightforward connect researchers to um, expensive computers that you would not want to replicate. Resource sharing was the term. It was logging into remote computers, but then it very quickly went from logging into remote computers to transferring files among these expensive computers. What Taylor wanted had neither the hype nor the expense of going to the moon. He was allocated one million dollars to turn the theories of a computer network into a reality. This was enough to start a chain reaction that changed the world. Of course, at the time, nobody knew it. We all knew that we were dealing with very powerful technology. But I don't think any of us 20 years ago or 25 years ago had any appreciation for what it would be like if you know, everybody on the planet had access to information or could produce information and share it. Taylor recruited Larry Roberts for the job. 
Roberts had built the world's first experimental connection between two computers at the MIT Lincoln Laboratories in Lexington, Massachusetts. I knew that I knew how to do it because I actually uh, had built the first network. I had lived with Len Kleinrock at MIT and learned about packet switching and queuing because he was my office mate. And so I had built the, the connection between the two computers as basically the same kind of connection the ARPANET had, except that now we're going to distribute it to more people. Roberts wasn't sure about the best way to network mainframe computers. One way would be to link them in a chain. But this design had a flaw. If you tried to interconnect the large computers directly, then each of those large computers would have to figure out how to work with each of the other large computers. So they would have a tremendous problem in their software to, to be able to figure out the rules and procedures and protocols for dealing with 10 different kinds of computers out in the country. On a cab ride home from a conference, Roberts was inspired with a better way to connect the computers when a fellow engineer suggested building identical special purpose mini computers to form the network and tie each timeshared computer to one of them. This way they only had to learn how to deal with the one little computer that you put there. It was a brilliant simplification and it made the universities more willing to participate in the network because it would not interfere with their own computer projects. On paper, Roberts had the network design figured out. Now all he had to do was find someone to build it. But it wouldn't be the telephone company. The phone companies, A, believed it couldn't be done. B, didn't think it would be useful or anybody would want it if it were done. And C, had huge investments in their current communication systems and weren't interested. If there was going to be a computer network, someone else had to build it. But who? By the standards of today, 1968 was a medieval time of communication technology. Typewriters, not word processors, pounded out letters. Most telephones used rotary dials. Black and white television was as common as color. The height of high tech was the lunar module, which had less computing power than today's personal computer. 1968 also was the year Larry Roberts sought out the engineers to build the Advanced Research Projects Agency's computer network, the ARPANET, the acorn that would grow to become the mighty Internet. It was going to be based on special purpose mini computers called interface message processors, or IMPs, and a revolutionary technology called packet switching. So here's the way it works. Suppose I want to send a long document. I feed it into the network. The first thing the network does is chop that up into a lot of little pieces called packets. And each packet is launched into the network and it tries to find its way to its destination, each packet operating independently. At the other end, the final destination takes all these packets, think of them as little postcards carrying your data, puts them back into a long document and delivers them to the recipient at the other end. The plan was to network four identical imps. Each one was to be attached to a different kind of mainframe computer. A Sigma 7 at UCLA, an SDS 940 at the Stanford Research Institute, an IBM 36075 at the University of California at Santa Barbara, and a PDP-10 at the University of Utah. Roberts asked 140 companies, including AT&T and IBM, to bid on the project. But the giants of communication and computers refused. They said it wouldn't work. No, they didn't think it would work. They didn't see that it was very important or mainstream. I mean, after all, communications, well, we've got, we've got our own communication systems here at IBM, and AT&T does the telephone system. I mean, what else do we need? What's your problem? So the telecom guys would say, little boy, go away. You represent no revenue to us. And they were right. We didn't. So little boy went away and created packet switching on its own. A small Cambridge, Massachusetts company, Bolt, Brannock and Newman, known as BBN, wasn't sure either, but they were willing to try. Frank Hart headed the BBN team. Well, we had to, first of all, figure out if we knew how to do it. I think, I think it was a relatively revolutionary concept to put together a packet-switching communication system, and no one had done that before. BBN won the contract and went to work building the EMPs for the ARPANET on January 1st, 1969. 
The first was due at UCLA in nine months. Hart's team faced a crush of obstacles and very little time. It's not like a scientific discovery of the second law of thermodynamics or, or, or finding what uh, DNA molecules look like. It was an engineering problem with, with dozens of very difficult, messy, undone engineering problems. And, and some of them were simply the fact that it was such a rushed schedule. UCLA was also under a deadline to write the software so its Sigma 7 computer could communicate with the imp. Ironically, graduate students were chosen to forge this first important link in the world's first computer network. The senior professors who were in charge of each of the projects, uh, the principal investigators as they're called, uh, really did not spend much time thinking about or focusing on it. It was left to the next tier down, to the graduate students or in some cases staff members at uh, places like SRI. Uh, just figure out something useful to do with this. Crocker wrote the code to join UCLA's computer to the first imp in what was to become the ARPANET. The idea of having one computer send a program over to another computer um, was a big leap in some ways, but very natural in other ways. But in those days, there was no commonality across the computers, and so part of what we had to think about was in order to make that idea work, there would have to be a common language, and we actually spent time trying to define uh, what that language might be. Back at BBN, Hart's team was facing numerous engineering challenges. One was, how do you stop the packets from circulating forever? How do they know when to stop at their destination? You dump a piece of message into the system, and now it's to wind its way through it at each node picking the best path. Well, what stops it from circulating forever? Uh, that was a very difficult technical problem. No one had done that. Uh, another thing, a host has a big message to send. It dumps the big message in. What stops it from overflowing? What, what, what protects them, the system from just having this stuff fall on the floor? And there was a concern about the phone lines. They were built for voice traffic, not data. Special hardware and software was required so that when errors occurred, the imps could retransmit the message. Also, there was no guarantee the mainframe computers would hold up. They were just not built to run nonstop as communications machines. Even worse, how would you know where problems were occurring to fix them? When some guy in some site hit a key on his keyboard, the message had to go from his keyboard to his big computer, from his big computer to the little computer, through a whole bunch of other little imps at other sites, and finally to a one at the destination, and then into the host, and then it had to come back all the way. And when the guy didn't get an answer, he didn't care where it broke, he just didn't like it. He kicked it, you know, he would yell and scream. So you had to have a way of finding out where it broke. And that was, again, a difficult problem for the network authority, which was us in this case. There were glitches up until the day BBN shipped the first imp to UCLA. In fact, BBN could have kept on improving it forever. I mean, there were people in the group that wanted it perfect, and there are other people that said, come on, come on, we got to get it out of here in nine months. It has to be just good enough. That was a kind of decision that I ended up having to make. What was good enough, and where, where did one seek more perfection? On September 1st, 1969, the first piece of hardware created for the computer network that was the forerunner of the internet arrived at UCLA. What I do remember is that they you know, slid the thing in place, turned the power on, and the lights immediately started blinking because the program had been put in when it left, uh, before it left BBNN, and it was just turned off. When they turned it on again, it picked up right where it left off. Now, there wasn't much of a network to speak of. I mean, there was the first node at UCLA. They didn't have anybody to talk to, so we just sent traffic to ourselves. By the end of 1969, all four sites were interconnected. Had this primitive computer network failed, the effort to network computers might have been scrapped as just another project beyond the reach of current technology. But it worked. In April 1971, the ARPANET had 18 mainframe computers hooked into the network. Bob Metcalf was a grad student who connected MIT's computer to it. The thrill was connecting things together. You know, there's action at a distance. How, you know, you can wiggle something here and it moves over there. So I was able to form packets of bits 
and uh, send them. And over the phone, the guy in California would say, I got it. And I said, well, send it back. And then he'd send it back. And those, it was the thrill of uh, <laughs> reaching out and touching someone or something far away. At first, there wasn't much to do on the ARPANET beyond transferring data files among its members. But then, a new capability was added, the first killer application that would bring in the masses and take the usefulness of computer networking to a new level. That killer app was email. I was actually working on a mail program, but it was programmed for a single computer so that you could send messages from yourself to another user on the same time sharing computer. And uh, I had written a couple of programs to transfer files, and it occurred to me that since the mailbox that I was sending these messages to was nothing more than a file, I could send that file across the network instead of keeping it within the same machine. And so I put two programs together, modified the code a little bit, and the first email program was, was created. Tomlinson did more than just write the code for email. In a keystroke, he gave the world a new icon for the information age, the at sign. The at sign was the most obvious choice because we're talking about a user who was at some computer, and it just made sense. Ironically, what would become one of the most popular applications on the Internet was a program Tomlinson wrote on his own time. It seemed like a neat idea. Um, Nobody was clamoring for email. I mean, there was nobody. Uh, we, our sponsor, Department of Defense, didn't say anything about wanting email. My boss didn't say anything about email. Um, but in fact, nobody said anything about email because the term wasn't coined until several years later. But um, it just seemed like an interesting thing to do with a computer and a network. And so I just did it. So then electronic mail became the completely unanticipated killer app, as we say, for the ARPANET. We went from remote login, file transfer, electronic mail in a year flat or two years flat. And then it stayed that way for 20 years. In October 1972, ARPA turned science fiction into science fact when it demonstrated the computer network in Washington, D.C. But unlike flying saucers, this idea really did take over the world. The telephone, television, radio, and postal systems are essential communication infrastructures for life as we know it. But as the world enters a new millennium, it appears as if the Internet, begun in 1969 as an experimental computer network, is gradually absorbing many of their functions. The Internet can do that because it was built with an open architecture. It's a superhighway with plenty of on-ramps, lanes, and no traffic restrictions. It handles whatever comes down the road. This generality of purpose is the brilliance of its design. We were very conscious that we were opening up new territory and that rather than pick very limited uh, applications, that we ought to lay a foundation that was as broad and open-ended as possible. Inclusion guided the network's development. Anyone could contribute ideas about its use and how to improve it. Ideas were offered as requests for comments so everyone would feel free to discuss and criticize them. Uh, I wanted to emphasize the point that we were not making assertions or um, uh, uh, edicts, but that we were trying to create a dialogue, that we were putting forth ideas and that um, uh, it was supposed to engender responses. and. Um, so we made the simplest possible rules. Anybody could write anything they want that it had no status, uh, that it got whatever credibility it got from its content, not from the fact that it had been blessed by somebody. There's a kind of internet culture which grew out of the academic community. What you find is that there's a tradition of sharing of knowledge that people will add to it. They will find mistakes and bugs and they'll fix them. They'll tell you about them and everybody else. The rate of evolution the rate at which the of new functionality can be added is very higher, much higher, simply because so many people are contributing to it. By 1972, the ARPANET had fewer than 25 sites online, yet more were coming. What sparked the increase was the first International Conference on Computers and Communication, sponsored by ARPA as a coming out party for its network. 
Bob Metcalf, fresh from MIT and Harvard, was in charge of compiling a list of just what the network could do. So all I did was contact all the people who had computers on the ARPANET, and there weren't very many, like 19 or 23 or some number, and said, do you have something interesting that's going on at your host that you'd like other people to access over the net? Metcalf could only find a few esoteric uses for the fledgling network, but at this early stage, that was enough for an impressive demonstration. By the time of this demo, I could find 19, 19 imagine that, 19 different things that you could do on the net. And they had a program that pretended to be a psychotic. They had games that you could play. They had uh, demonstrations of symbolic uh, manipulation of uh, mathematical formulas. They had uh, uh, more technical things like remote job entry for submitting jobs from one computer to the next and getting the results back. But demonstrations sometimes go wrong and at the wrong time. Well, imagine a graduate student, big red beard. I put together this book, and in walks 10 AT&T executives, all in pinstripe suits. And they needed someone to give them a tour of the ARPANET, so I was the natural choice, having done the book. So they gave me these 10 executives, and I started giving them the tour. And right in the middle of the tour, the ARPANET, for the only time during the two or three days of the demonstration, the net crashed, the computer, the imp, crashed, and the demo froze. And here's this poor graduate student having worked on this for several years and being his life's work, and he turns around, and these 10 AT&T executives thought it was funny. In fact, were somewhat amused and happy that it had crashed, because this was very reassuring to their lifestyle and their technology that this packet switching was just too unreliable and they didn't have to worry about it. And the fact that they were amused uh, angered me greatly, angered me. In fact, to this day, many years later, I still have a thing against telephone companies for that reason. After the conference, the development of computer networks took off. Networks soon began to multiply throughout the Western world. The National Science Foundation made being on their network a requisite for receiving grant money. Soon, other networks emerged. There were LANs, or local area networks, to link computers throughout offices. And WANs, or wide area networks, to link computers across buildings or campuses. But each new network was like a foreign country speaking its own language. Could disparate networks be interconnected to make an internet work? In 1973, Vent Cerf and Bob Kahn teamed up to develop a set of rules or procedures known as the TCP IP protocol that, if followed by different computer networks, would allow them to pass their message packets back and forth. It's protocol, which actually is, is the term used to describe a little piece of uh, papyrus that goes on the front of a scroll. But the protocol on is, in fact, the little thing that tells you what's in the rest of the scroll. We use that term because packets have headers on them at the front that say where they're going, where they came from, and what information they contain, and then comes the information itself. And we thought that represented a protocol, too. The TCP IP protocol enabled the networks to interconnect. Surf and Khan called the computer in the network that would know the protocol and thus be able to communicate across networks the gateway. This puzzle has some pieces already on the board. I had computers of various kinds. I had networks of various kinds. And I wasn't allowed to mess around with the networks. The only place that could know were the outside of the networks. Well, what's outside the networks? The host computers are outside. And then I needed something that would interconnect the networks to each other. And as Bob and I discussed all this, we concluded we needed something that we call a gateway that knew how to talk to each of the networks it was connected to, which could be two or three or four, and could encapsulate, envelope, packets coming from the host computers into packets going through the underlying networks. Others proposed different protocols, but if there wasn't a common one for all networks to follow, a common language, there would be several internets instead of a single unified one. Finally, in 1983, after 10 years of refinement and bureaucratic haggling, TCPIP was adopted as the universal standard, marking a milestone in the development of the Internet.
a common network of interconnected networks. If we have enough in common, if we hold enough in common, then we can communicate. If we don't hold enough in common, it's much harder. Uh, so, in fact, the reason that the network works at all is that we have worked very hard to create all this commonality so that we share enough knowledge to make it possible to convey information to each other. The ARPANET was developed as a tool for defense research and restricted to select universities and think tanks engaged in government projects, not individuals or businesses. For this reason, private networks like Prodigy, CompuServe, and what came to be called America Online started to spring up where individuals could join in. Still, the Internet had not reached Main Street, USA, but a major milestone in its young life was about to see all that change. Unlike technological breakthroughs that swelled the use of computer networks, this milestone was political. It would unleash the full power of free enterprise and American ingenuity and bring a worldwide communications network into the home and office. The Internet grew by the fate and fortune of new technologies. Among them were breakthroughs in electronics that brought mainframe computer power down to the size and cost of a desktop PC. The silicon chip, the high-speed modem, and the computer mouse are as significant in shaping the use of the Internet as the first imp. However, one of the Internet's major milestones was achieved not by technology, but by an act of Congress. On June 9, 1992, Congress passed a bill taking the Internet out of the exclusive hands of government and into the public. The following November, President Bush signed it into law. The Internet had crossed the Rubicon. The government, in particular National Science Foundation, which had been investing in research in the ARPANET and then the Internet, began to get the idea that maybe this should be turned loose, this technology should be turned loose into the, um, the open world for commercial use, for whatever use. And that unleashed a lot of uh, commercial energy and competition and progress. By allowing free enterprise and individuals access to the Internet, the seeds were planted that would flourish into many new and previously unimagined uses. But the dream of easily sharing information among computers was thwarted by the complexity of finding it. It was like having the Library of Congress at your disposal, but being unable to gather what was written on a desired topic without tedious and often discouraging hunts. Under 1980s technology, it was difficult to research a topic without being a computer wizard. Around the same time that Congress was opening the Internet to more people, a physicist named Tim Berners-Lee at the CERN Research Institute in Switzerland created an easier way. CERN was a microcosm of the rest of the world in that it was global. A lot of people reporting to different institutes trying to solve problems together. But unlike the rest of the world, most people had workstations on their desks. Berners-Lee developed the software to more easily follow threads of knowledge within the information stored throughout the Internet. Computers are good at storing information in trees, uh, in matrices. They'd been programmed to work like that. They hadn't really been programmed to store information in random, as random associations, so that when you smell a particular type of coffee and it takes you back to the coffee house where you first smelt it, that is the sort of thing a brain can store. That's not the sort of thing that computers were programmed to store. By using a computer mouse to click on a word or phrase linked across the internet, one could instantaneously follow a link from site to site around the web in pursuit of a topic. The crisscrossing of these myriad threads across the globe reminded him of a web so he named his invention the World Wide Web. The next thing you know, it started growing on itself. It went from just Tim in his little computer in Switzerland to a, uh, a worldwide phenomenon carrying billions going on trillions of dollars of commerce. It's just an incredible story. And completely unexpected. None of the geniuses who designed the ARPANET in the beginning had any idea that anything like that would happen. Even though the World Wide Web made it easier to follow threads of information, 
it was not terribly user-friendly at first. But it gave the Internet a revolutionary new capability beyond file transfers and email. Still, in 1992, there were only 50 web pages on the Internet. If the World Wide Web made the Internet more accessible, another development rocketed it to near instantaneous acceptance by people far and wide. This was a very user-friendly software used to browse the World Wide Web. It was developed in 1993 at the University of Illinois by a 22-year-old student named Mark Andreessen. It was called Mosaic and later commercialized by Netscape that enabled access to the World Wide Web and therefore made it a lot easier for people to get access to content. Mark Andreessen's browser turned the Internet into a graphically rich world, the very signature of today's Internet. It was able to display text, use scroll bars, jump around the web at the click of a mouse. In short, it was the essence of user-friendly. It wasn't the first or the last browser, but it was a breakthrough application. In this case, a short video... The like killer that. app that brought the fire of the Internet and web to humankind. In 1993, after Andreessen's browser hit, the web grew by 341,000%. By the late 90s, the Internet had grown in simplicity of use, complexity of performance, and multiplicity of information. It now had completely redefined the use of the personal computer. What was once an in-house word processor and spreadsheet calculator was, by the end of the 20th century, a way to get out of the house without leaving it. A way to go online with the world. Well, the only reason you have a television is because of the network, and pretty soon that will be true of computers, that the only reason you have a computer is to be on the network, not to do word processing and spreadsheets. Those are incidental. At the start of the 21st century, the Internet is turning everything from business to games to dating into a series of keystrokes and mouse clicks. Everything the free enterprise system can put on sale is going online. Web pages can even turn one person's interests, no matter how unique, into a source of information for others. This online community, called Netizens, now communicates and connects around the globe, unfettered by boundaries and borders, all because of this great communications infrastructure that was built like a great cathedral, one brick at a time. This marvel of art and science is still very much under construction. To make something happen on the scale that it has worldwide, it really takes lots of people to see opportunity and go capitalize on it. The combination of email as we've traditionally known it, augmented by graphics and video and, and, and voice, is going to become um, the, the wave of the future. And it's going to be hard to tell the difference between voice communication and email, because if email can contain voice, then that will probably suffice. It's coming right now. What began as a million-dollar investment by the government in 1969 to link computers to share information was now, at the turn of the century, the future. At present, there are over 11 million domain names registered on the Internet and nearly 70 million websites. www.com and at are the new icons of the information age. With the enormous use of the Internet and the web, innovation and evolution will continue and it will reinvent communications of all kinds. I don't think we know yet just how important this is. Many of us believe that this is, in fact, the telecommunications infrastructure for the 21st century, that it will absorb and support all of the other media, telephony, television, radio, and, and of course, conventional computer communications. But in some sense, it's still early days. Remember that this system is no older in 1999 than the telephone system was in 1900. You know, the telephone's 123 years old. The Internet is only 30 years old, and it's got a lot of future ahead of it. So don't think for a moment that this little look at the history is going to capture it all, because it's happening right now, even as we sit here.